achievement. The United States and the European Union are warning Russia not to annex Crimea after voters there overwhelmingly backed a referendum to leave Ukraine and join Russia. Crimean authorities said 96.8 percent of voters in the Black Sea Peninsula supported the referendum, but many members of the ethnic Ukrainian and Muslim Tatar minorities in Crimea boycotted the poll. Earlier today, the Crimean parliament also voted in favor of the region joining Russia. The situation in Crimea has sparked the gravest crisis in East-West relations since the Cold War. U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry said the vote in Crimea will not be recognized by the international community. The United States' position on that referendum, I must say, is clear and is clear today. We believe the referendum is contrary to the Constitution of Ukraine, is contrary to international law, is in violation of that law, and we believe it is illegitimate and, as the President put it, uh, illegal uh, under the Ukrainian Constitution. Neither we nor the international community will recognize the results of this referendum. And we also remain deeply concerned about the large deployments of Russian forces in Crimea and along the eastern border with Russia. On the eve of the vote, Russian forces seized a natural gas terminal in Ukraine just outside Crimea's regional border. Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov defended the referendum vote in Crimea, saying there's a historical precedent for peoples and regions pursuing self-determination. As far as statements by our Western partners on unacceptability of the referendum, I've already explained our view on the subject. We base our position on the fact that nobody canceled the right of people to self-determination. This right is one of the main principles of the United Nations Charter. Tension is also rising in other parts of eastern Ukraine, which has seen a series of pro-Russian rallies. Earlier today, the Ukrainian parliament endorsed a presidential decree for a partial military mobilization to call up 40,000 reservists to counter Russia's military actions. It's also unclear what will happen to the Ukrainian military bases in Crimea. They have been surrounded for weeks by Russian forces. To talk more about the situation in Crimea, we're joined by Oliver Bullo from Crimea. He is Caucasus editor for the Institute for War and Peace Reporting. His book is called Let Our Fame Be Great, Journeys Among the Defiant People of the Caucasus. Nicholas Clayton is a freelance journalist who just left Crimea. He has covered the South Caucasus since 2009. And in Moscow, we're joined by Dmitry Trenin, director of the Carnegie Moscow Center, recently published an article in The Guardian titled The Crisis in Crimea Could Lead the world into a second Cold War. Let's go first to, um, to Crimea itself. Oliver, can you talk about the vote? Uh, what took place? Uh, what was the atmosphere and the response right now with this overwhelming uh, vote for secession from Ukraine to join Russia? Well, the first thing about the vote is the result. The result was never in any doubt. The um, only option, essentially, on the ballot paper was either when well, he had a choice to leave Ukraine or to join Russia. There was no no option. So there was never any question that this would go one way. Um, and it did indeed go that way. It went that way overwhelmingly. Though, though personally, I, I think possibly the results given are a little bit inflated. I, I, I can't believe that the turnout was as high as 83%, certainly considering the fact that the, the, all the Ukrainians who live in Crimea and all the Crimean Tatars who together make up you know, uh, uh, more than 30 percent of the population boycotted the poll. So no, I think the can, results were inflated. But can you explain, Oliver, people. what the question was? What was the vote? Of, uh, what were the questions that were asked? The choice? Well, there were two. There were two choices. There wasn't a yes or no question like the ordinary referendum is. There were two choices. One was to join Russia, and the other was to return to the 1992 constitution. Now, I'm personally not entirely sure what the 1992 constitution consists of, and no one I talk to ever really seems to know. But that didn't matter. Right? In fact, only three percent of people voted for that option anyway. It was an overwhelming 97 percent in favour of joining Russia, and that's certainly what the government here has been pressing ahead to, to, with today. They've already passed a series of laws to. Uh, move to the Moscow time zone to adopt the ruble, uh, to, to accept a lot of money from the Russian budget, that, which will double the, the budget, the amount of money available to the government here. So yeah, they're not wasting any time in, in Parliament, so it should be said the mood on the streets is rather subdued, I think, probably because there was such an enormous party last night that quite a lot of people have got a bit of a hangover this morning. And what was the atmosphere in Crimea during the vote? 
Well, you know, it, it, it was people were turning up to the polling stations, people were, were casting their votes in a fairly orderly manner. But I mean, it got increasingly jolly as the day wore on, and it became obvious which way the vote was going to go. And, and people gathered on the central Lenin Square underneath the big towering statue of the, of the founder of the Bolshevik state. And, and, and there was a rock concert, and, and, a, and, and people gathered, waved Russian flags, chanted Russia, 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 as if they were at a football match. It, it occurred to me about halfway through that it was a, like a combination of Russia winning the World Cup and the Nuremberg Rally. It was a very peculiar atmosphere of sort of a degree of, of celebration and also of a strange and slightly disquieting sense of triumphalism that, that I, as a, as a, as a non-Russian, found, found a little bit weird. And the attitudes of the different populations, those were, who were boycotting, those who were voting, the attitude of the Russians in Crimea, and also the press. Well, I've just been talking since quite a long time, talking to a Ukrainian lady. You know, she was telling me that, that for her, for, for, for Orthodox Christians, they have three mothers. They have their own mother, they have their uh, their motherland, and they have the, the Virgin Mary. She was, she, her own mother died last year, and she said it felt to her like like cancer that took, cancer took away her own mother, and now cancer had taken away her motherland, and all that she had left to, to trust in was, was the Virgin Mary. That's what she told me. She was absolutely devastated by what had happened. Uh, the Crimean Tatars, who, who, as I say, uh, they're a Muslim minority here, they, they're also very concerned, um, definitely on edge about the, the, the prospect of of, of going to Russia, they, they feel that Ukraine has guaranteed their rights um, very well over the last 23 years, and they, they have no interest in joining Russia at all. However, the, the, the majority of the population here are Russians, and, and, and they're very happy about it, not least because they're going to move on to the, the, the Russian system of social security and social benefits, which means that pensions will at the minimum double, and so they're all already counting the money. I've, I've uh, spent a bit of time in, in, a, in a bank this morning, and, and uh, there was a steady queue of people going in to ask the cashiers when exactly it was that the, the new Russian benefits would start arriving in their bank accounts. Uh, Dmitry Trenin, uh, you're in Moscow at the Moscow, Car at the Moscow Carnegie Center. You've written a number of pieces for different publications. Your piece for foreign policy, Welcome to Cold War II, This is What It Will Look Like. Talk about the, this vote um, from, where, from your perch in Moscow right now. What is the attitude there? Well, I think that the attitude of uh, most people in, uh, in Moscow is that uh, the— uh, uh, the people of uh, Crimea have been able to decide their fate, and uh, they're joining Russia. There will be some sacrifice that uh, the Russian people will have to pay for that, but it's uh, certainly worth having because uh, uh, what's been done is uh, correcting the injustice committed about 70 years ago when uh, Crimea was detached from the then Soviet Russian Republic and attached to the then Soviet Ukrainian Republic. And from the attitude, uh, the the position of the position of President Putin. If you could explain uh, what he sees right now and what uh, the Russian Parliament will do. Well, I think it's. Uh quite clear what the Russian parliament will do. The Russian parliament is paving the way for Crimea to become part of the Russian Federation, a republic within the Russian Federation. And uh, they started working on that uh, some time ago. Uh, they are pretty well advanced. Uh, there will be no delay. So I think that uh, in terms of the Russian constitution, everything will be done quickly so that uh, Crimea becomes part of the Russian Federation. As I said, this is something that is uh, uh, widely supported by the bulk of the Russian population. Mr. Putin's uh, approval rating has uh, already very high. Last month, 61% uh, has uh, increased to about 71%. So the bulk of the people uh, welcome uh, Crimea's reintegration, reunification with Russia. Uh, this does not mean that uh, uh, a lot of people disagree. Uh, part of the intelligentsia, uh, uh, the opposition, especially the non-systemic opposition, those who are not represented on the Duma, uh, they staged uh, a march in Moscow. Uh, not a very numerous one, but uh, uh, but a demonstration of uh, uh, rejection of this, uh, of this policy by President Putin. Now, I don't think that Putin pays too much attention to that. He sees himself on the right side of history. 
He sees himself correcting the injustices done at the end of the Cold War, at the end of the Soviet Union. He sees himself supported by the Russian people. And uh, he is well prepared, I think, to take on his opponents, both domestically and internationally. Eight U.S. senators concluded their trip to Ukraine Saturday after meeting with leaders of Ukraine's interim government. This is the group leader, Senator John McCain. I don't believe there will be a reignition of the Cold War. But I do believe it's long overdue that we understand Vladimir Putin for who he is and what he is and what his ambitions are. This is the person that stated that the greatest catastrophe of the 20th century was the breakup of the Soviet Union. This is a person who wants to restore the near abroad. This is a person that uh, occupies parts of the sovereign nation of Georgia, that occupies the trans Transnistria in Moldova, that has now acted in an in a act of naked aggression. And again, all of us are concerned about recent reports of an additional military buildup in, in this area. And so we have to treat him for what he is. And that does not reignite the Cold War, but it means we enact steps that make it clear to Vladimir Putin that his ambitions will not be realized by the uh, great community of nations that would resist it. That's Senator John McCain, uh, just back from Ukraine. Dmitry Trenin uh, in Moscow at the Carnegie Moscow Center. Your response? Well, I think that uh, we can debate what constitutes a Cold War, what, what does not. In my view, a situation in which um, there is more competition than collaboration uh, is would be my uh, my uh, uh, explanation or my uh, uh, explanation of, of, of what the Cold War is. I don't think that uh, people will uh, pay much attention. People here will pay much attention to what the senator has just said. I think they basically see him and uh, so many others as being. Uh, um, um, trying to hem Russia in and uh, hold Russia down, and uh, um, I don't believe that uh, this 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 is something new. However, I think that uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the 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 policy of Putin uh, will not uh, aim at actually um, making. Uh, the confrontation more than 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 what it will necessarily be. I think that Putin's um, uh, ambition, if you like, or Putin's uh, uh, next aim is to um, help Ukraine towards some kind of a federation, some kind of a system in which the southern and eastern portions of that country, uh, mostly Russophone, enjoy a wide degree of linguistic, cultural, and economic autonomy, and that Ukraine itself as a, as a country uh, does not um, join NATO or the European Union or, you, or become associated with the European Union. That, I think, is Mr. Putin's call it ambition, call it plan, call it, call it goal. But that's, I think, what he is aiming at. Dmitry Trenin, I think that's something in the United States people don't exactly have a very uh, uh, informed concept about. Russia's attitude toward the expansion of NATO, could you explain how Russia sees what has taken place over the last years? Well, first of all, let me clarify that by Russia, I would mean uh, primarily the Russian establishment, uh, the Russian government, the Kremlin, and the and the establishment. I think that that the establishment have seen NATO's enlargement, which uh, began about two two decades ago, uh, as an attempt or as a as as a project by the victorious powers in the Cold War, led by the United States, to consolidate their wins at the expense of uh, Russia's security. They saw NATO uh, coming closer to Russia's borders, and they saw their own bids, and there have been numerous bids by Russia to join NATO. They saw those bids rejected by uh, essentially the United States. Um, so having uh, no chance to become part of the alliance and having the alliance, which used to be the Soviet Union's adversary in the Cold War, coming closer and closer to Russia's borders, they uh, certainly became uh, uh, very concerned. And I think that from the 
standpoint of Mr. Putin and his associates in the Kremlin, uh, Ukraine is a red line, and anyone who, um, who ventured out there had to be met with some kind of a response, which is exactly what happened after the uh, toppling of uh, President Yanukovych, who was, you know, someone who was neither with, with Russia nor fully with the West, but he was replaced by a, a virulently anti-Russian and, um, and notionally pro-Western uh, bunch of people, and that, to Mr. Putin and his associates, was the West crossing the red line. And uh, the attitude of the United States, uh, when it came to what took place and Yanukovych being pushed out, calling that constitutional, but calling the referendum Crimea unconstitutional? Well, I would say that the Russians have uh, become used to people essentially using uh, various standards uh, for their own behavior and uh, for other people's behavior. Uh, basically, President Putin, in his uh, press conference recently, uh, intimated that he was doing uh, the things that basically the United States was doing. He was, uh, he was placing the legitimate above the legal. If you need something and you need it badly, you go for it. It may not be legal, but if it's your if it's in your national interest, then you go for it. Except that uh, the cases of uh, Libya or Kosovo or Iraq arguably were less important for the United States national security interests than the issue of Crimea and Ukraine is or was for Mr. Putin and the Kremlin. We're talking to Dmitry Trenin in Moscow at the Carnegie Moscow Center, Oliver Bullo in Crimea with the Institute for War and Peace. And when we come back, we'll also be joined by Nicholas Clayton, a freelance journalist who just came from Crimea, is in Istanbul. This is Democracy Now! Stay with us.